Hello, this is Dr. Babo. Let's get with lecture nine of our metaphysics of East and West. Can we start with a prayer? Father, we ask for your favor and touch that we may grasp and understand, that we may serve our people better, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's start with round of applause. Yay! Um, uh, I hope I could inspire you. Uh, well, review uh, was a lecture, but actually, I'm gonna skip that today because I, I I think I spent too much time reviewing. So if you want to review, I guess it's recorded. I realize you could go back, lecture eight. Um, so let's just jump right into lecture nine. Uh, we're gonna talk about the existential epistemology, 실존적 인식론 in Korean, and I I kind of share that. Uh, few lectures ago about how during my PhD realized that I could really bring the um and yang, the light and darkness, so yin and yang, uh, in understanding, approach of my research. Because uh, we come from a totally different uh, perspective. We see from different perspective. And I'm going to kind of uh, try to demonstrate that. What do you see? I mean, this is famous, right? This famous picture. Uh, someone said, oh, I see a beautiful lady. I said, oh, really? Wow. Uh, or someone said, I see a grandma, right? <laughs> so if this is a nose, then you see grandma. If you see this is the side of the face, you see a, a beautiful young lady. What about, what about this one? The famous illustration, do you see devil or angel, right? Well, they said that you see what's in your heart, so be careful what you, how you answer. <laughs> what about this? You know, it's the same object, but depending on where you shine the light, you're gonna have different things. Like someone says, that's four. I said, no, that's three, right? What about this? No, it's six. No, it's nine. <laughs> it's, it's not the change of the reality of what you have. It's what perspective from where you're looking at that gives a different value. What about this one, the classic? God, no dog, God, dog, right? The world outside of us and our experience and our interpretation of the experience. Okay, and that's called epistemology, right? Um, this is the truth, right? Uh, it's not issue with either this or either that. No, it's both and, right? It's both and. And, and so talking about from looking at different uh, aspect and you know culturally speaking there's a young uh, designer Yang Liu design and she was able to demonstrate uh, the difference between Western uh, culture and the Chinese culture it's more Asian culture specifically red in China and so she said that well this is handling of problems right go right through right uh, whereas uh, Asians they kind of try to avoid the problem things like that uh, you know, actually, but during this COVID-19, we're going through, this is September 2020. I don't know if this is true for America, you know. Um, punctuality, you know, it's like, bam! You know? I think that girl uh, uh, was in Germany, so I guess she's designing for Germans. So, I mean, this is German precision. Right? China's like, well, you know, waiting in line. This is so true, you know. I've been to Shanghai, Beijing. And then some other Ximyang and some cities in China, like, bam, you know, let's say, oh, there's an opening for train ticket. And this is like, everybody, get to it. Opinions, like, well, you say what you mean and mean what you say. Well, but, you know, Asians tend to go round and round and round and round. Really do not really uh, talk about how you really feel. The connection, uh, it's sort of like uh, very self-centered, individualistic, you know, you connect with people, you connect. Whereas in Asia, it's like everybody's like, it's this us. I versus us. Uri in Korean. In Chinese or the Asians see more in perspective the whole, uh, whereas analytical minds of the West divides, isolates, break it apart. So, uh, and I'm not saying this is better than the other. Of course not. It's You need both. It's always both and, as the fire and 
the water mingle, as light and darkness mingle, as yin and yang mingle. And so you know, I, I've been writing a, a testimony book per year. And my thing is pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. What do you think pillar of cloud is? Pillar of water and pillar of fire. Yeah, so uh, when you look at the diagram a little more closely, um, it's both deductive and both inductive. You know, usually when you do a research, they ask you, is this deductive approach or is it inductive approach? And what, what I found out actually uh, through my research, as I started my research in 2009, until 2011, it was very positivistic, deductive, and ethic observation. It's more technical stuff. And then as it went on and, and then it progressed, then it became more. So I was able to embrace both my epistemological uh, diagram embraced both positivism and interpretivism, right? And the second phase was the other. So finally, let's talk about metaphysics then, right? Um, and we're now covering, and our class student uh, started translating this in, into English to Kamai, but I was actually would uh, go uh, verse by verse, uh, or word by word, actually, and talk about what is atrophy. And the, the point that he's making is that the essential ground of science has atrophy. You know, Martin Heidegger saying, science just messed up science. It became chaotic. Science became too crazy. I'm thinking, wow, 1920s, scientific development? He was freaking out on that? I mean, this is crazy, right? Yet when we follow their most pop proper intention, in all the science, we relate ourselves to to beings themselves, we relate to beings themselves as if they exist. This is the main idea. In the 1920s, new scientific ideas changed the way people look at the world. New invention improved transportation and communication. You, know, you, you, really, you really laugh at this. The collapse of the American economy in 1929 triggered a depression. And in the 1930s, several countries, including Japan, Germany, and Italy, adopted aggressive militaristic policies to control people. Right? And this is the invention they're talking about. The television for the home, the little screen. And finally, they were able to invent hair dryer. <laughs> and that's what Martin Heidegger was freaking out about. Well, do you agree? Disagree? Why not? Right? Uh, this is a time that I'll actually give my class a uh, small group discussion time and they'll talk about it. Mata Hoshe, what do you think? On and on and on. Well, you could do that if you're using this as a teaching somewhere. Go ahead, stop, pause now and do the small group discussion. They'll be good to hear. And, yeah. But we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Yet, when we follow their most popular intention, precisely from the point of view of the science, or disciplines, no field takes precedence over another, neither nature over history, nor vice versa. So he's arguing that, listen, science should not be unquestionably followed. Everything has to be in the equal ground. So he's arguing that, that no particular way of uh, treating object of inquiry dominates the other. Mathematical knowledge is no more rigorous than philosophical historical knowledge. It merely has the characteristic of experience exactness which does not coincide with rigor to demand exactness in the study of history is to violate the idea of specific rigor of the humanities right isn't that wonderful so he's saying that well yeah mathematics and history they, they both require scholarly rigor and rigor is something that we really apply but it's just that exactness you know math two plus two equal four it seems like, oh, yeah, it's, it's exact science. Whereas humanity is like history. Well, you know, uh, could be ambiguous. But that is the precise the point, right? So what is academic rigor? And I, I tell them about the importance of rigor and how they need to be rigorous in their research, and especially your final paper. And, and then we break it into small group again. <laughs> so they could talk about their paper. And, and, and as I said over and over again, I'm not interested in you memorizing my lecture. I'm interested in and challenge you to think. That was the review of our last lecture, isn't it? And that Martin Heidegger thinks that we don't really think anymore. That's why there's a death of philosophy. So he's uh, continually saying that relation to the world that per pervades and math, physics, engineering, they all stand on its own. One is not uh, superior than the other. 
right? And then I asked them, well, do your homework. Now, uh, the, the first part, her uh, translation was over. Now we're going to Sarat Um, or we call him Socrates. According to the idea behind them in the science, we approach what is essential in all things. This distinctive relation to the world in which we turn our beings themselves supported and guided by freely chosen attitude of human existence. It's about removing the subject-object distinction for Heidegger. Well, we're going to talk about that and we're going to bring in um, Kogito Ergo soon, right? Descartes. And, and so that subject-object distinction uh, Heidegger is trying to get rid of. Okay? To be sure, he argues, to be sure, man's pre-scientific and extra-scientific scientific activities also are related to beings. So he's trying to say, he's trying to bring the whole scientific uh, re understanding into being, not argument about the existence of being. Right? But science is exceptional in the inner way peculiar to it. It gives the matter itself being expli explicitly and solely the first and last word. The, the being controls the argument. Okay. In such impartiality of inquiring, determining, and grounding, peculiarly, peculiarly delineated submission to begin, beings themselves obtains, in order that they may reveal themselves. Wow. We stop and talk about that or continue? Let's just continue, because I think this will kind of explain. So this position of service in research and theory evolves in such a way as to become the ground of the possibility of proper through limited leadership in the whole of human existence. Is this human existence Dasein? Right? And then he argues, the, the special relation science sustained to the world and to attitude of man that guides, it cannot, of course, be fully grasped only when we see and comprehend what happened in the relation to the world so attained. World so attained. Man, one be, being among others, pursues science. Let, let's go on. Uh, in this pursuit, nothing less transpires than the interruption by one being called man into the whole being. Indeed, such a way that in and through this eruption, being break open and show what they are and how they are, right? Erupt. You know, eruption that breaks open, help being of them. Do you understand, right? Uh, this is uh, actually comes from the uh, Dr. Dreyfus point. You deal with it. You flow. Right? You, you, um, it's like self-realization. Like how, what he explained is that Martin Heidegger saying that here I am, you know, Dasein, you know, and you're kind of thrown in to the world. And you deal with your existence as you live your life. You know, it's like opening the door. You, know, it's like you don't really think about it, you know, but you have your existential moment of opening. And, you, and a lot of times you, you forgot how you did that. You know, you do that kind of subconsciously, right? Uh, unconsciously. So uh, you have your being. You, uh, the existence precedes essence. So how, how is it done? You know, all that. No, you just, you have your being. You kind of flow into your existence, right? Um, and then this trinity, or, you know, the whole thing. This trinity, relation to the world. So I'm just picking up on the first line. This trinity, relation to the world, attitude and er eruption, is a radical unity, brings a luminous simplicity and aptness of Dasein to scientific existence. Aptness is quality of being appropriate, right? You're kind of apt to. And then they talk about this trinity. So what is trinity Heidegger talking about? So when I type up the word trinity, <laughs> it's so funny. This was the first image I got. I thought it was, no, but I think it's, it's more using the language of the Christian faith. You know, Trinity is Father, God, the Son, God, and Holy Spirit, God, right? And so he's bringing the Trinity into the argument by saying that the world, attitude, and eruption, that in the middle of it is Dasein. That's your existence, right? And, and, it's about removing the subject and object distinction for Heidegger. Heidegger's arguing primarily against 
um, rationalism, Descartes. That's what he's arguing about. You don't think, therefore I am, right? René Descartes, you know, right? To cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. He has talked about being in only the context of cognitive, you know. But Dasein, here I am, is more existential, right? I'm in the world. Deal with it, <laughs> you know. That's what he's saying. So, um, basically, in a way, the rationalism gave birth to science, and science, uh, you know, we, we raving about how science improved our life, because, but then what he's saying is, no, you need to question science. You cannot host, take, the, take, it in, take the whole thing in as a wholesale. Be careful. So that's, what's it, that's what he's saying. Okay, so this is Heidegger's um, definition and ground rule. If we are to take explicit position of the Dasein illuminated in this way for ourselves, then we must say to which the relation to the world refers are being themselves something and nothing besides that from which every attitude takes its guidance are being themselves and nothing further. So he's playing with words, something, nothing, nothing, things like that, right? Once again, um, that is which the scientific confrontation in the interruption occurs being themselves and beyond them nothing. But what is remarkable is that precisely in the way scientific man secures to himself what is most properly his, he speaks of something different what should be examined are being only and besides that nothing, being alone and further nothing, thoroughly beings and beyond that nothing. So it's kind of playing with words, you know. But he's still laying the foundation. For what? You know, there, when you play uh, volleyball, you bump, you set, and bam! So there was an introduction, right? And then paragraph six. Now paragraph seven is the ultimate spike. So what is spiking is, what about this nothing? The nothing is rejected precisely by science, given up as nullity, void. Right? So Martin Heidegger set it up. Now he's going to attack it. It's going to attack it and then talk about science and, you know, linear uh, exactness. Now you talk about maths as very exact thing, but that's actually, it's just rationalism and, and science cannot deal with the void, right? But existential, uh, full, uh, existential uh, epistemological understanding, now we could embrace Dasein, here I am, right? And so concludes the understanding of Dasein from Martin Heidegger. And now he's, so basically, um, oh, I ended much faster than I thought, but, because <laughs> I just went, went right through. Uh, but uh, it's important that we understand that you know, he's using the language and he's, you know, playing with words, but he's setting it up so that he could really attack and argue against the rationalism. And, and, and he's saying that existentially, the, so he's in a way, uh, uh, as a phenomenologist, he's saying that we have our being without thinking about it. E existence precedes essence. And so he's setting the stage. Here I am. So he's saying that what's the science? Really, maybe have improved, but the sense seems of the exactness. Uh, but that doesn't really make it right. So you need to embrace both and... Whew. Well, um, I hope it was helpful. Did I confuse you more? <laughs> I'm sorry if I did. But um, maybe uh, ne next lecture, maybe I could kind of re uh, watch this again and, and continue but explain a little more. but I mean he's, he's setting the stage so that now he's gonna argue uh, and then when I bring um, Rob, Robert Perzik's a book on Zen and art of motorcycle maintenance and other stuff it will make more sense but just overall picture now know that Martin Heidegger set it up now he's going to strike and argue against uh, not to get rid of but to say that existentially you need to embrace both all right. Well, see you next time. I hope uh, you tune in to the next one. Lord bless you. Bye. Bye.